end up after you log in, you should end up with a page which looks like this. Can what, some of you try it and let me know if you can get there? You can ask me on chat or with your microphone if you have any. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, at least one person can. So, so uh, can can a couple of you others also tell me that you can actually access the page? I think we have one person who can. Well done. <laughs> Certainly, the system works. Okay, uh, okay. S somebody wanted one more. Uh, okay, so if you go to this page here, which is section five point one. Uh, which is if you f if you look here under session five, section five point one, there is a section called randomness here. So if you just go to that that section, then at the bottom of the page you should find you should find a link here. Anyway, I will cover this one more time. I just wanted to see if uh, some of you can access this page. Uh, it's not essential because I will demo everything today, but uh, of course, if you can access this page. Okay, excellent, excellent. So uh, I will cover this. So at least two of you can. So the rest of you just uh, give it a try. I'm going to start the, I think it's time to start the session. Okay, so let's start today. Um, uh, I'm really uh, excited about today's session because we will cover a lot of very interesting things. Uh, but first, I want to just quickly go over a couple of things related to labs and the course, how, uh, up, a course update. You might have seen a couple of emails from me, so you might be familiar with this. But anyway, so in terms of the course now, we have three more sessions left. So it looks like we are uh, well on our way to being done here. But uh, the three sessions which are there will be full of uh, useful and interesting material. And you still have an option to influence what we discuss here. So let me know if there's stuff you want to discuss in more detail. But today we will talk about data science and I'll give you kind of a hands-on walk through to some of the ideas in data science. In the next class, of course, since we talked about data science, in the next class, we'll talk a little bit. Of course, I'm limited to about an hour of talking about how can we manage data using uh, uh, how can we manage data using Python, which I think is a very important topic for us. Um, and then after this uh, class, um, you can uh, basically interact with databases, pull data from databases. I'll even show you how to write data to files and so on. And so that should be a, a reasonable foundation. Of course, these are very big topics, both the topics here. And then the last one is, I guess we can't leave uh, a Python course without spending some time working on strings and understanding some object-oriented programming. Again, I don't want to make it too object-oriented heavy, but I'll give you a, a work, working knowledge of uh, objects and classes and how to use classes, especially in libraries that you will encounter. So hopefully that's, um, uh, maybe you can tell me on chat, does that sound like a plan? Is that uh, cover some of the topics or most of the topics we talked about at the beginning of the course and covering? Uh, let me know on chat. Anyone? Sounds interesting. Sounds like a good plan. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so now I want to talk briefly about labs. And, oh, you know, I want to share with you that I created these labs primarily because I want all of you to write a lot of code. I could have easily made this course based on some multiple choice quiz questions, and that would not be, I think, serving you well. Now, if you're writing code and learning Python well, then you've basically met your goal. And then my job is to help you be successful, right? So here's what I want you to do, and I'm gonna give you a quick walkthrough of how to do your labs, okay? So the first thing I want you to do with the labs is when you go in here, I'm gonna say some things and, you know, when you go into your labs, make sure that you have spent some time reading all the instructions. Maybe there's too many instructions because the labs are big. Take one chunk that you want to work on. The second thing is, as soon as you read the instructions, please, at least in the beginning, think about how would you test code once you write it. So I'll give you an example. If you take this function stats where I asked you to calculate the mean of something, the first thing you must do is you can make your own file. You see here, I've created a file called mytests.py. And in this file, I have only one test. You can just comment out all the tests I've written. I'll explain to you in one second why I have written those tests. But you just write your own tests. And I really, really want all of you to take some time thinking about if I'm writing a mean function, what is the way to test it? And so here I'm giving you a quick example. 
one way to test a mean function could be, let me just take a small list for which I can even compute the mean in my head, right? Or I'll plug the mean into uh, Excel or power, whatever numbers, my favorite uh, spreadsheet, and I will know what the answer is, right? And then I will pass this list to my function. And if my function meets the answer, then my code is correct. This is important, right? And I want to empower all of you to get to this place where you can basically think about how to validate your code. And then you sit down and you say, okay, now I'm going to write it. And now I've just written this. I'm giving a solution. I'm quite happy to share solutions as long as all of you are, uh, you know, practicing writing code. So look at the code here. I want you to appreciate this code says the mean is the sum of if you take n elements in a list, the mean of the list is the sum of all the elements divided by the length of the list. And you can see how pretty this Python code is. At least to me, it's very pretty, right? Because naively, you would have thought I should write a for loop and I should know how big the list is and all that stuff. And it's not. It's very declarative and it's clean. So if you ended up writing code like this, then you're well on your way to being a good Python program, right? It's one line solution for the mean. I don't know, you can tell me on chat, did you think that computing a mean would be one line? I'm not even using a library, right? Of course, later you'll see that when we use powerful libraries, you'll use a stats package and call mean on that. But why I'm not doing that right now is because you must learn how to sum the elements in a list and how to calculate the length of a list and so on. So in some ways, I've given you this assignment thinking that statistics may be interesting for us. Statistics may have been challenging to us in the past because we had to punch things in the calculators and so on. And now you control this much more efficiently, right? So as soon as you write this code, you run the test and it should tell you, you know, that you wrote one test and you passed your test. Now you go to the next question, right? So if you go down this path and you end up with all your code completed and all your tests passed, now you can look at my tests. Now, why did I make my tests available? I made my tests available to show you how I would probably grade. Okay, I'm not trying to remove points from all of you. Okay, I want to give all of you 100%. So I am showing you what kind of tests I may, I'm, I may run. Of course, if I want to be clever, I will show you these tests and I will run a completely different set of tests. But I'm not specifically trying to be clever about testing you. I'm relying on all of you to put in the time and take the benefits of practice. Okay, so you can run these tests. Now, at some point, if you think your function is right and my test is broken, then just hit submit. So you don't have to even send me a copy of the code. Just hit su submit. If you want to be helpful, you can tell me at what time you hit submit. Hit submit and just send me the send me an email saying, you know, I'm not passing your test or whatever. My tests are passing. Please take a look. And I will take a look and we will have an exchange and a discussion. Okay. The reason I'm saying is I had some, some type. Okay. If you guys look at my course website and all the code that we've discussed so far, you'll see there are, I don't know, tens of thousands of lines of text. And these web tools are very unfriendly to me because I had a copy paste from here and there and everywhere. So it's very easy for me to make mistake. For example, I think I had a mistake in my code where I had this in my tests. <clears throat> so if you try to submit, of course, of course, oops, sorry. I'll see, and you can see how easy it is to make typos in this thing, right? So of course, if, I, if you try to submit, you're gonna fail this test. Yes, you can submit as many times as you need. Yes, no problem. I've, I've also removed that restriction, right? Because, but you shouldn't be trying to submit 100 times. I want all of you to get to a place where you submit once. If there's a problem, you submit maybe one more time and then you send me an email. And then I'll look at it and we have a discussion and then we can figure it out. So please follow this protocol, okay? And because uh, you can tell me on uh, in with the microphone over chat, this is the way I see all of you getting maximal benefit, okay? That, and then also create this habit of once a day or once in two days spending half an hour writing code. It's not enough to just wait till the lab due date comes up and then you furiously try to submit and get something done, okay? So build up this practice and build up your strength. That is much more important than any grade you can get. Okay, having said all this, a few of you have requested some extensions for various reasons on the labs. Maybe this is the first big lab of this kind uh, that you've had to do. So uh, uh, can you tell me on chat, does anyone want extensions? other than the couple who have written to me? Or has everyone on the call right now uh, completed your labs? Okay, at least one more. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Looks like all of you want. Okay, so I will, I will give you an extension, okay? Uh, and uh, I will send out an email later, maybe over the weekend, 
but please don't use these extensions to delay practicing writing code okay make sure that you take your time and you practice and you write code regularly okay so with all that said i think we're ready to go uh, to the session if you have any questions on this topic just post it to me okay so today we have a very big uh, a very big topic uh, it's a very daunting topic to cover i want to give all of you a flavor to what data science means okay and uh, as i get started i want you might have heard three uh, kind of topics in 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 the same conversation data science machine learning and ai and so I, i'll make a quick working definition of these three topics the first idea is that data science is very broad generally defined as the science of discovering insights and relationships from data right anything you do with data can fall somewhere in a broad umbrella under data science okay it's a fairly new uh, topic there's a little buzz with it but roughly we can use this as a definition so it's kind of broad so you could say anything you do with data falls somewhere under data science okay now machine learning is slightly more well defined it's an older field and the idea was that is it possible for machines to learn something by themselves if you give them some inputs and typically those inputs are all data inputs the question is can the machine perform some analysis of those data and discover from this data some rules right some ideas and rules that would make them uh kind of intelligent in some ways they learn some rules and relationships from the data so that becomes this field of machine learning and then the last field is ai now ai is really the oldest of these i think really in some ways maybe the oldest of these fields and the idea was is there a notion of an intelligent machine and then how do we create them and so on but ai and machine learning overlap in that today we think that one way to make machines intelligent is to let them learn from data there are other aspects to ai for example you could think of machines learning stuff because we encoded rules and wrote programs that made them intelligent okay and so there's a big discussion as to which which approach or which com is it a combination of these two that is eventually going to create an age of intelligent machines but that will be a big discussion topic for us so uh Uh, i want i want to stop the theory here and pretty much start doing some concrete things so i just leave with that uh, and then give you a quick overview i want to actually show you uh, how to uh, build a model using data how to infer relationships and do a small machine learning task uh, uh, or a data science task and then you can do a lab on this as well okay so can we have a quick poll based on this uh based on what we just said uh what is i would just like to know everyone's interest and background okay so let me see some of you have taken courses and studied it uh some have studied statistics but not used python okay so this will be helpful right so you will get for those who know the stuff please ask questions and interrupt me and so on and push me forward if i'm going slow um but uh, hopefully this will be useful and then jupiter notebooks uh, so i let me see okay okay most of you don't have it okay so um some of you have it so now let me quickly make one statement okay we are starting to get to this point in our course where it probably makes sense for all of you to have some kind of python installed locally uh i will post in the end of this session or next section ne next session instructions for local installs it is not very hard and uh, you can run everything locally i think also you know given how flaky something like code board is if you forget to save it doesn't save your code etc it makes sense for all of you to start working locally and then just copy paste your answers into code board or something and hit submit okay so so we should start thinking about local installs okay so let's get started with the actual class uh, for today so of course this whole uh, topic starts off with a discussion about randomness okay but this time we are going to do something slightly different so i want to say that you know last time we talked about random number generators we said that there is no real random number generator but only pseudo random number generators but now i'm saying if i take the data from random numbers generators and plot them in some interesting ways i get patterns and so we can uh, start asking questions about these patterns okay so in order to do that uh, i want to use uh, a, what a jupyter notebook and i'll give you a quick intro to oops i don't think this helped but you can if you if all of you on the website with me please go to the bottom of this page 
and there's a link here. If you click on this link, it should bring you to a, a cloud hosted Python instance. You should log in with your Windows account. Okay. So please give it a try and let me know. Uh, please give it a try. Uh, yeah, I'm able to make this bigger now. Please give it a try and let me know if you can log in. Okay. If you're not able to log in, that's fine. Um, I will uh, I will show you everything and then we can deal with any login or access issues later. Okay. So once you're here, you will you, once you log in, you will end up with a page which looks like this. And this page is basically all of the files that go into a virtual machine. Okay. So in order to create the virtual machine for yourself, you can click the clone button. Right, and you will get a clone. Remember, the clone will be your own personal copy of everything that is here, and uh, it will stay with you. Uh, you can look at it whenever you want. Okay, once you have cloned it, uh, there's this button here which says "Run on free, uh, free compute." Okay, so this, if you hit this "Run" button, it will give you basically access to a virtual instance of uh, Jupyter and Python running in the cloud. Okay. So now again, obviously you can see I'm doing this because this has become an industry standard tool and all of you should know a little bit about this. Okay, so this is the page you will see when you launch Jupyter Notebooks. I'm going to give you a quick intro to Jupyter Notebooks. And then if you click on this introduction to data science, this is actually a notebook. So if you click on this, it will launch, uh, it will launch a notebook session for you. Okay, remember this is a cloud hosted notebook session. It will stay alive as long as you're working with it. Um, but once you disconnect from it, or once you stay idle for 30 minutes, it will shut down. I will pause for a minute. Can, can most of you or some of you, some of you are further ahead, can you just go ahead and give it a try and let me know if you're here? Excellent, at least one person has it working, wonderful. No, if any of you hits, okay, okay, more than one, <laughs> wonderful, okay. So, so, oh, excellent, excellent. So you're going to all have fun with this, okay, really, I think. Uh, so let me tell you that like with, can you repeat what we do after we sign in and press clone? After you press clone uh, on this page, which looks like kind of like this, there should be an arrow here, which says run on free compute. If you click on this arrow, it should launch a session for you. Okay, and if you if you launch when you launch the session, you will see a page which looks like this, and on this page you just click on this file called Introduction to Data Science, and then it should get you to a page which looks like this. So hopefully everyone's here, uh, Christian. I hope you are there too. My arrow isn't click clickable. Okay, if huh, I'm. Did you clone it? Did you hit the clone button on top here? And you are logged in, hmm. And this arrow isn't isn't clickable. Okay, so maybe we can debug this together. Maybe on Monday in office hours or something, we can uh, quickly troubleshoot this. Okay, or you can we can try it offline. Okay, yeah. Okay. So um, what did I want to say? I wanted to say, but by the way, uh, for office hours, uh, when I was talking to one of you last uh, last week, uh, I was told that. Monday at 10 o'clock is a busy time for you and you all of you have other classes and so on. So if you want to talk to each other and give me another time, I'm happy to reschedule that to a time that's more convenient. Okay, so please give it a thought. Uh, these conversations, there's plenty of stuff to discuss. Okay, and I cannot uh, cover everything for you. But anyway, I will try. Okay. So now, uh, so now, uh, okay, for this session, uh, I'm going to use my own notebook. You can continue working with uh, with the notebook here. So first of all, let me explain what is a notebook, why am I using notebooks, etc. So the idea here is that we want to work with Python interactively, but we would like not only to have code, but we would actually like to build entire documents, right? So when you scroll through the document, you see all kinds of charts and discussions and analysis, but everything is interactive, right? So we want to make interactive notebooks uh, I think there's a lot that we can do here, right? You can embed audio and video and various things here. But for today, we will just do code and text and images. Okay. So the first idea is, okay, how do I create anything here? It looks like a static document. So of course you can do, you know, you can do these drop downs. Most of you come from a windows background, so you can probably use these drop downs, but I would just use a, a keyboard shortcuts. 
because I like them. So for example, let's start here. If you're on the first cell, if you hit escape and hit A, right? A for above, it'll create a blank cell right on top of your notebook, okay? And a blank cell is just a place where you can type code. So if you type, no, 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 two plus, two plus three, and then now this is the one thing you have to get used to. You have to do shift enter, not enter. Okay. Then you have actually basically a Python session here, right? And you can do anything you would do with Python. Uh, for example, you can define a function, right? And so let me just type some code here. Okay. And then you can actually, uh, let me, teach you some Jupyter tricks here. So you can just say SQR5 and Jupyter knows that you're displaying something. So it'll actually print out 25. Okay. So it's a nice interactive editor that you can use. And then when you're done, you can hit save and it'll save your code. Okay. So that's so far as code is concerned. Quickly tell me is, is there any uh, questions about creating a cell? I said A for above. If you want a cell below something, you hit B for below. So for example, if I want to sell below here, you hit B. Sorry, you have to hit escape. Escape B, that will give you a blank cell below. And then you can start typing. Is that, can you give me a clue? Is that okay? Are you able to type and do something? Yeah, this is one of the ha bad habits in Jupyter. Okay, if you want, uh, it, it, there is a way to tell Jupyter to display the last n lines of output. Okay, of course, remember if I did something like this, if I did X equals square of five, then it gets assigned to X, so there will be no output. But if I put X on a blank line, then it's evaluated, it will give you output. But right now, it, Jupyter by default prints the last outputable statement in your code. Okay, if you want the last five or the last 10, there's some ways to tweak it. But for now, just use this. There's no harm to write print, okay? Uh, that's kind of maybe a good Python programmer might actually write print x. Anyway, just a little trick here for you. If you want to be lazy and just type x, it will just do it. Okay. Now, if you want to write more elaborate statements, not just show the value of x, then you have to actually create a string, you know, blah, 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 like we did. Okay. So give it a try. Uh, make sure that you can actually um, write your own code wherever you need it. Now, the next thing I want to show you is if you take a blank cell and you want to write some comments or do some stuff, this can become a big topic, but I'll show you. There's a drop down here which allows you to convert the cell. So there are two types of cells here the record cells and markdown cells. And markdown is basically a dialect of HTML. I'll show you how it works in a second. But markdown allows you to basically create documents which will get converted to HTML. So, in, so let me start first by making this a markdown cell. Uh, so you can click on this to make the blank cell a markdown cell. I like to use shortcuts, so I use escape M. Okay, that'll make it a markdown cell. And now I will type, this is a test. And it, you see, it doesn't get evaluated as code. Now, one of the bugs you will have in the beginning is that this cell might be made a code cell by mistake, or you wouldn't have changed it. And then if you try to run it, of course, Python will complain. So if you're writing text, make sure you are in uh, markdown mode, okay? Okay, so that, that allows me to get into Markdown world. By the way, this thing is very friendly in terms of uh, help, okay? If you click on keyboard shortcuts, you'll get a whole lot of help on keyboard shortcuts. If you click on Markdown, it will tell you much more about Markdown. So at least these you can play around with. And there's even a user interface tool which gets elaborate. If you want to take it, take it, and then come back with questions. Okay, so if, so now let's just get back to Markdown quickly. I will just show you a couple of things that will be very useful. So if this was all, then it's just a basic text editor, but it's a little bit better. So for example, to make a heading, I just put us, there are some markdown, uh, instead of writing HTML heading, for those of you who are familiar with HTML, in markdown, if you put a single hash, it will make it into a heading, right? If you put a, if you put a double hash, you'll get a subheading and so on, right? So, Okay, so you see that you get headings, subheadings, and so on. If you need to make a list, you can make a list very easily by saying, again, this is all markdown syntax, right? So you say item one. So the star makes a list, item two, etc., right? And you'll get a bulleted list. 
Okay, so all of you have started on this journey of, you know, learning a little bit of my, by the way, for those who are HTML gurus, if you want to just type HTML in here, it will just work fine, right? It will, whatever you put in HTML tags will get rendered correctly automatically. When you hit shift enter, it will automatically format itself. Okay. So, uh, so, okay. So we get, uh, so we get started here. Um, and then now I want to start talking about random numbers. Okay. If you have any questions on the interface, send me email and we can talk more. Uh, I want you to just use the basic features right now. So shift enter is all you need right now for this session. Okay. So the first thing is, uh, I am going to do something very delicate here, which is I'm going to use libraries minimally. Right, because later we will use libraries, but right now we will use this as a way to show that we can actually get started and understand things by writing our own code. So I will use libraries minimally. Okay, so for example, I'm using this library called NumPy. So if you see in the top here, I have actually imported NumPy and the, uh, the namespace is NP. So if you do, NumPy has got random numbers in it. And if you do this, this will create a random number generator. Uh, I won't get uh, into uh, discussions about random number states and seeds and so on. If you're interested, of course, just send me an email or ask me a question later and we can get into it. Okay. But how do we use this? Well, you set up a random number. It's a good practice to always initialize it with some seed. The seed will dictate what kind of sequence will get generated. Okay. If you want a different sequence to get generated, you change the seed. Okay. Then you can choose a number of points. So in this case, I've chosen a hundred points. Um, the scale is just a multiplicative factor. Okay. Uh, so you will, you will, you will see this in a second. Uh, and then you can basically create, uh, so one, you can basically create random numbers. This is a command here that creates random numbers. Okay. And what are what are the important things here? First of all, what kind of random number generator? We'll come back to this in a moment. For now I have chosen for those of you who know statistics and so on that I've chosen a normal, or a Gaussian random number generator. Okay, we'll see what that means in a second. I've asked you to generate me 100 points and these points can be scaled. Okay, so I can make the, you know, I can change the size of these points by multiplying by some number. We've set the scale factor to one. Okay, and I've called it noise suggestively, but uh, if you hit shift enter now, you should be able to run this and see, uh, and see what the noise uh, variable is. Um, for those of you who joined a few minutes late, if you missed the startup, I would say that if you go to section 5.1 under the section randomness, there's a link to an online notebook uh, that you could use, uh, but it'll take me a few minutes to get you started on it. So maybe you can wait and just contact me later. Okay. And just follow along with this section and then we can get you all caught up later. Okay. Okay. So I have created some points. And the question and the task at hand is how do you look for patterns? Uh, yes, uh, you can define, yeah, I can define mean standard deviation, etc. So I'm coming there, right? So we can do all kinds of statistical analysis. So for those of you who have done lab four, you already have your own stats tools, right? You can calculate the mean and the standard deviation, but more interestingly, a picture is worth a thousand words. And what I wanted to show you with the Jupyter notebook is the easiest thing to do is to plot a picture. So I'm just taking all that data and generating a picture, right? And uh, those of you who have done stats know that this is actually a histogram, right? And how do we create, what is the definition of the histogram? You create bins of certain size and you count how many of these random numbers fall into different bins, right? And then you get some distribution, right? You get a shape here. And this shape is what we would like to think of as characterizing this set of random numbers. Right. And those who spend more time studying this understand that this is suggesting to us that these random numbers occur with some probability. There is a certain probability that's associated to each bin. And so there is a probability distribution. Right. And so those who are thinking about normal distributions, this is suggestive that there is a distribution here, but it doesn't look very normal at the moment. It looks like some skyline to make it look more and more normal. This is kind of things you can play with. Increase the number of points. The more points you increase, the more normal this distribution will look. Okay, so play around with it and you already start to see and build up this strong association that I want you to build up. It's a puzzling association, isn't it? We started off by saying we're getting random numbers and now we are saying, well, there's actually a pattern here. 
and the pattern characterizes what kind of distribution it is. Okay. Of course, immediately we can ask the question, are there other patterns? And the answer is yes, there are other distributions and you can look up the random number um, documentation to see that how to get hold of other distributions. The simplest one is a uniform distribution. So if you take up this word N here, you'll get a uniform distribution. So that may be another small exercise for you to play. Just change this rand n to rand and see what happens, etc. Okay. Okay. So we, we started off with, uh, with, uh, with getting this idea that there's a distribution. Now let's start talking about signals. Okay. Or, or, or relationships and mathematically one of the simplest and nicest ways to model relationships is to think of a function, right? So y is equal to f of x suggests that y and x are related in a very specific way through the definition of this function f. And the function here, let me take this particular function, y is equal to mx plus c, probably familiar to you, but uh, okay. So we somehow we say that this is a linear relationship and we must ask the question, okay, why do we call this linear and what is m and c? So all of you probably know this, but with Python, we can do something really nice, which is you can run this code and I get sliders that allow me to change the value of M and C, right? So for example, let's try to see what happens when I change the value of M. So for those of you who are using the online notebook, it may be a little slower, which is why I'm using the notebook, which is running locally on my machine. And we talked about installing it for you locally, but just give it a second. If you move the slider and you watch the screen here, it'll update this value right now. M is two. If I make it three, you can see that when M is three, it's getting steeper, right? So it's very reasonable. And I like this interactive approach of understanding that M is actually the slope because when I change M, I can see exactly how the behavior changes. Okay. And C is the intercept or it is the point at which the line will intersect with the Y axis. So I can just increase or decrease C by, by changing it. And you'll see when I make C exactly zero, the intersection is at zero, right? So again, little bit of interactive mathematics for you play around with it, but I wanted to just show you that it's really powerful for you to be able to generate these kind of tools right inside your notebook. And if you're sharing your research with other people, this could be all kinds of interactive ways for them to explore your analysis. The user of your notebook does not have to change the code. He can just play with the interactive tools that you give them. Right. Um, let me pause for a second. Does, uh, does anybody think this is all cool or it's kind of, Oh, I've done this in different ways before, and this is all nothing new under the sun. Quick comment. Very cool. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So as I want to say to you, I'm not, no, by the way, yeah, this, I'm just showing off some of the capabilities of this infrastructure. Okay. Clearly this is a big topic and I cannot be exhaustive for that. We will need another course and I can spend a lot of time on every, every last detail of what we can do in here. Okay. And for those who are looking at this and saying, Hey, that's cool. That's nice. You must go away and think, how does that work? How do I pull a slider here and actually have something happen on the screen like that? Right. Um, and then if you figure it out, let me know. Otherwise we can talk about it another time. Okay. So it's clearly, I'm just suggesting to you, there's lots of interesting stuff here. Explore on your own. That's where you'll make maximum benefit. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, hopefully we understand what is linear relationships. I just put a little note in here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but here, instead of a linear relationship, it's very easy for you to change this to a quadratic relationship. Okay. So instead of returning MX plus C, you can just say, I will return X squared, right? Or, or whatever, whatever you want here, right? You can make it into, and then you can explore different functional shapes through this mechanism. But today is not about exploring nonlinear relationships. We'll stay in the linear space, but I'm going to do something right away, which is uh, interesting. So I want all of you to take a second. I'm going to fix my relationship right now. Oops. Uh, I'm going to fix my linear relationship right now. And I'm going to choose the values. M is two and C is five. Okay. So the slope is going to be two. Uh, and the intercept is going to be five. Okay. And then I'm just going to plot this for you, but I'm going to plot this by a very uh, simple manner, simple idea. Uh, if you look here, you will see what I did. I generated an equally spaced set of points, which go in the interval. So I've used this function from NumPy 
it's just basically generating an array okay you could have done list range 0 to 10 as well okay but what this will do is it'll generate an equally spaced set of points in the interval 0 to 10 and there will be 100 points in this interval so think of writing this on your own as well it's a quick little exercise okay but of course for industrial strength things you might as well just use the library okay so I, I'm working on this delicate line between using libraries and letting you write code in the initial days. It's always good to know how these things work. And then you can just delegate everything to libraries wherever possible. Okay, so when I plot this, I get the obvious thing. If I take linearly spaced points and feed them into this machine, which is the linear relationship, and then I scatter plot them, looking for the relationship between X and Y, I see that there's a perfect relationship, right? I mean, it's, it's linear as we said it, and you can see the intercept is five, and if you can calculate the slope, it will be two, okay? You can calculate it visually if you like, okay? Uh, okay, so there can be little aspect ratio type issues here, okay? If it's not a perfect thing, it's a long discussion about how visual displays are created and so on, but okay. Um, so now the interesting part of this talk is <laughs> I'm going to take the noise we generated earlier, and then I'm going to add it to this signal. Right? So I've taken this nice linear relationship. Then I have sampled 100 points from my normal distribution and I mixed it into my data. Right? It's kind of like a, I'm trying to make my life uh, resemble what might happen in nature. So what happens when we do this? So if you do this, if I add those together, so you can see all I did was I took my linear relationship and I added some noise to it. Right? And now if I plot it, you see the line has got smeared. This is where I talked to you about that scale parameter. If I make the scale parameter bigger, you can make this signal more and more noisy, right? So we'll get more and more fuzzy. Okay, and now the million dollar question, right? Which is in this example, I built up this signal for you with the noise in it, and we know exactly how it came. But suppose I had just given you this data and said, can you please find out what is this linear relationship that is embedded in here? It looks linear from the graph. Can we find it? How can you find it, right? So that is one of the core ideas in, you know, statistics, in data science, in machine learning, is to discover this exact relationship that was put into here, into here, right? Now, once we do this for this particular set of data, we will erase all this and I'll go out into the wide world and we'll get a data set from there where we don't know what the relationship is and say, okay, can I use the same tools to now figure out what that relationship might be, right? So it should be a very easy thing for us to do once we do this all systematically. So before, so, okay, that's basically in a nutshell for me, this is one of the key aspects of data science, right? Figure out what is the actual signal that's hiding in your data, okay? And in this case, it's a simple, um, uh, it's a simple story. Now I will mention two keywords here. If you've done statistics courses before, they call this linear regression, right? And linear is because we assume or we like to think that this relationship is linear. Regression is a bigger topic. Why do we call it regression? I will come back to it. I, if Do any of you know why it's called linear regression? You can tell me on chat, I will look, okay? But by the end of this talk, hopefully we will understand this, okay? So how do we go about actually, so now my task or our task is, Okay, if this is my starting point with this, some data that looks like this, how do I extract everything from here, okay? So I thought this is a good way for, for, so we must come up with an algorithm, right? And a good way to come up with an algorithm is to say, I will guess some kind of linear relationship. And using that really linear relationship, I will predict. So once I have the relationship, I can plug in an X value from the data and predict what the Y should be. My linear relationship depends on two parameters. It depends on, oops, sorry. It depends on M and C, okay? It depends on M and C. So now I can ask the question, how good is my guess? And the answer is my guess is dependent on M and C. So my guess is uh, good or bad. I have to come up with a concrete measure. The simplest measure I can think of is to subtract the actual data point from the predicted data point. So that's the simplest measure and it measures the distance between the actual data and my predict my guest predicted data, right? And this is almost, we are almost there, but it's not good enough because sometimes my prediction can be positively higher and sometimes my prediction can be negatively higher. And because I want one number that characterizes the whole data set, 
if I start adding these quantities, they will cancel. So we don't want them to cancel. We have two options to eliminate the sign. Either you can do a square, which will get rid of the sign, uh, or you can do an absolute value to get rid of the sign. And both of them have been used. Okay, and then we can talk about the details of which one to use, when and where and how. But for now, let's just use the square. So a very simple, I want to stress these ideas, right? We can just follow very simple logical progression and get to some very powerful tools. So we just take the predictive value, subtract the actual value. It will be a function of M and C. And now I'm telling you, find the best value of M and C that minimizes this cost or this quantity. And we're done. Okay. Uh, maybe somebody can tell me, was that obvious from the start? That this is the way we will solve this problem or this is a way to solve the problem? Anyone? I'm looking at chat. Quick. Total silence. No, was, was it easy to come up with this idea how to find M and C? That you just have to, you know, assume some relationship, plug in an X value, predict something, subtract it, square it, we'll get a cost function, we'll add it up for all, for all values of data, and then Okay, so some of you like to look at it in code. Good. Okay, that's all it is, right? I'm just trying to say that this kind of exploratory approach is fun in some ways, okay? And for some people, this is natural. For some of you, it's not. But I do want to stress to you that something which I do in my math discussions, the mathematics should be logically simple. It's not just some formula for regression, blah, 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 right? There's a very simple logical progression that leads us to this conclusion. Okay, having said all this, I just want to say, okay, so now I want to minimize this. So how would you minimize it? Now I'm going to say to you, why don't we do it manually? So all of you should just run this and see. Uh, so look at this plot. It's very interesting what I've tried to do, but for you, it may be a little choppy because you're online. Okay. Uh, sorry. I haven't initialized with noise. Okay. Uh, but you can try it. Uh, if you've been running it along with me, when you, when you, when you change the slider, it will allow you to uh, change the slope and you can see, you know, you can see what is going on. You can, you can try to find the minimal value. Let me just fix, fix my data again. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. So if you look at this now, you can see, you know, the starting value, if I have M is one and C is one, it's clearly far away, right? And you can spend a lot of time. Notice how it's very tricky to minimize this function because there are two variables. So I will give you a strategy that I like. I kind of imagine a line in my head. And then the first thing I do is I try to find a C that matches the line that I imagine. And this might be, you know, this might be a good value of C, okay? Where I was imagining a line that goes like that. And so it would have an intercept here. So I kind of solve the intercept problem first. And now all I have to do is find a slope that's reasonable. And so I start increasing the slope. And you know, this seems quite reasonable. The line passes through the data. And my cost function is what it is, right? There's some number for my cost function. So you can play around with this, but it's kind of cool to say that manually I have minimized this function and I'm going to predict the values M and C is two and five. Okay. Now in this case, we know that we encoded the signal by choosing the values M is two and C is five, right? If you look at where we created this data, we had put in the values two and five. What I'm telling you is by doing a manual procedure, I have rediscovered those values, okay? So this is very interesting. There's a lot of visualization we can do here to understand, you know, how does the space of M and C look like and where is the minimum for the cost function? And there's lots of cool things you can do interactively. Okay, but clearly we don't want to be sitting there doing everything inter interactively and then this can get more complex, multidimensional and so on. So we want formulas, okay? And so today I'm going to do, uh, there are two nice approaches to do this. I'm going to do one approach here, which is just going to give you a formula. 
there is another approach called gradient descent, which is kind of along the spirit of remember how we did the square root uh, finding in an earlier exercise. Gradient descent is very similar using a Newton algorithm. You can find MNC, but it may be a little bit more work than we want to do. So let me just go with this. So the idea is that finding the best line here that minimizes this cost function is a simple problem. For those of you who know calculus, it's very simple. That cost function depends on two variables. You differentiate with respect to those two variables and set the value equal to zero and solve. You will get these two equations. Okay. So take it, take it as given. You don't have to get uh, overwhelmed by the calculus, but let's just look at this, right? The slope is basically you take for each X, you subtract the mean and for each Y, you subtract the mean, right? And then you divide everything by it's effectively the variance. There's a one over N factor, which is not one over N factor, which is not here, but it's kind of like the variance. Okay. So it's a very simple looking formula. Those who have done statistics will start recognizing this formula as various other things. Okay. But for now we can just say this is designed to give us the slope. And then the intercept given the slope is quite easy. You take the mean of Y and you subtract the slope times the mean of X. Okay. Which slope you have actually computed here. So your task essentially for this class is basically to encode these two functions. Okay. And your labs are basically giving you plenty of time to write this and play with this and so on. Okay. So I've written it here. So you actually have it. Please look at the code and come back to me with questions or whatever. Right. Why did I write it this way or that way? Please do. Um, I don't think I need to go line by line. Uh, you guys are pretty good at code right now. Okay. But now I want to stress the important thing here. The important thing here is that now we got back an answer from this program that said, given the noisy data, I'm actually able to infer that the slope is two and the intercept is 4.7, which is reasonably good given that we put in a signal, which had a slope of two and an intercept of five. Okay. And you can see that there's a certain amount of noise. You can play with this. You can increase the scale of noise and see how good or bad this procedure can be. Okay. In terms of inferring a signal that we already encoded and we know what the answer is. And then once you have this, now we can just basically predict, you can calculate the cost function here. I've calculated it. So you have some number for the cost function. And then you can basically do some other stuff here in terms of you can say, okay, so therefore, okay, now I have to stress a very important thing. So after you do this, so if you have a piece of noisy data, you do this analysis, you discover some MNC, you also look at the scatter plot and you see that when X increases, you know, Y increases or something like this, we can infer that there is a relationship, but we cannot suggest that X causes Y to happen. This is a very important foundational philosophical and mathematical and profound discussion, right? That if two variables are correlated, does not mean one causes the other. And a couple of fun examples are given you in your quizzes. So when you read it, you might smile about it, but please spend some time thinking about when is correlation causation. And I want to just take you immediately to a research subject, which is how do we understand causation done? Because if all we are doing in statistics in this type of analysis is measuring correlation, if I wanted to study causation, causal relationships, right? Eating sugar causes diabetes. That's a causal relationship. How do I establish causal relationships? Okay, big research topic there, a lot of interesting ideas. It's fairly, um, it's fairly active now in the world of machine learning, etc. So spend some time thinking about causation. Okay. Okay. But Nonetheless, now that we have this, you can go ahead and make predictions. Okay. And in order to predict it, all you have to do is you set the values of M and C, you plug in an X value and it will predict a Y value. And so this little plot here is actually the red line is all my predicted values for I've drawn it as a line instead of drawing it as points. Okay. But there are points corresponding to each X value here, which would be my predicted Y values. Okay. So let me pause. Um, let me pause here and quick. Uh, so this is a quick introduction to the problem. And then we we'll go and look at some examples. Okay. A quick introduction to the problem of what we are trying to do here. Uh, extracting parameters that characterize the signal. Uh, easy, hard, clear, need some more time. How are we doing?
Anyone? Okay, so very quiet bunch. <laughs> I keep trying to get all of you to, to interact a bit more so I can recalibrate. Okay, yeah. So like I said, practicing this in code is probably the best thing, right? Yeah, definitely take some time to practice this in code. So in fact, talking, uh, uh, talking about how to practice this in code, I've created two small labs for you, okay? And uh, I don't mind sharing some of the, uh, some of the ideas in the lab. So if you go, if you go to the code, uh, okay. So let, let me just say something to you. Uh, now that you have the notebooks, you can, you can continue to perform your analysis. Sorry. You can continue to perform your analysis in the notebook. Uh, but I need to basically stress that the reason I use the notebook as opposed to code board here is one to give you access to an industrial strength tool and two, because this particular tool has reasonably good interactive and visualization capabilities, right? So I wanted to share with you the power of a good tool like that. So I understand that it's one more tool for you guys to work with and I would not want to do this, but I think uh, understanding Jupyter Notebooks is probably relevant to anyone today who's doing work in Python, okay? so at least take this as your introduction. Eventually, I want all of you to find the best tool that works for you. Some of you might like an editor like PyCharm or Visual Studio Code. Some of you might like in Jupyter itself or your favorite editors. I think that just becomes a style choice, right? I myself have found uh, certainly for classes and for discussions and for reports in, the, in, in, in companies, this is really a nice way to summarize a piece of research analysis, right? So you create a document like this, you put your code in there, you access data from different places, analyze everything, then you can share it with people. So it's a reasonably nice collaborative framework. What it does well is capture all of the conclusions and analysis in text and the charts at the same time. And typically, like you could say, I could do this in PowerPoint, but if you do this in PowerPoint, you cannot, the other people cannot interact and change the code and so on, right? So this is a little bit more fluid in that sense. Uh, there are tools inside the notebook that allow you to convert this into a presentation and so on. But I won't go there. If you're interested, let me know, we can discuss it, okay? Uh, so, okay, so uh, I will also, just for, for amusement, I'll say, you know, like, for those of you who like XKCD, there is a little, somebody wrote a little, oops. Uh, I don't have this working right now. Uh, why would this be? Yeah, typos, of course. Yeah, so somebody wrote a little XKCD type cartoon generator so you can make your graphs look kind of cool and funny. Okay. Uh, so anyway, here is a whole discussion on gradient descent that I won't go into, but I will talk about this data now that is in your labs, okay? So if you go back to the website and look at the labs, you will get the instructions for this lab, okay? And what have we done in the lab? I've said in this lab that a data science startup would like to make offers to new employees based on data. So I've given you the data. The data is in this file, employeedata.csv, okay? If you go to CodeBoard, uh, you, will you will find a solution already set up for you with these files in there and starter files and everything. So when you go from the lab, it'll take you straight to CodeBoard so you can start working on your labs there. Uh, but what is our task? Our task is to read this data and then analyze it. Now, because we have, uh, for various ordering reasons, I did this class before we did the class of how to read the files, etc. You can just, uh, I have provided you code that will automatically read this data and load it into two, uh, into two lists basically, right? So after this data has been read, you will get two lists. And then we can just, of course, the first thing you do when you get data, I think now you all of us will be convinced is to say, okay, let me do a scatter plot and see if there's a relationship, right? And I guess if we stare at this scatter plot long enough, we can be convinced that there is some kind of positive correlation here, right? As the number of years of experience increases, the salary increases. The question which we are looking to do is to find the exact nature of this relationship or a reasonably exact nature of this relationship. So you have two assignment tasks. One is to extract the exact relationship or the relationship we think is the best one that characterizes this data. And the second one is use that relationship to predict the salary of someone with 
five years or 10 years of experience. I forget what I asked you to do. Okay. So that's, that's the task. Uh, so let me just pause quickly and say, does that seem doable given what we know right now? Let me also, okay. At least one person says yes. Okay, good. Good. So I just want to, I want to stress again. Okay. So here's, let me just show you, since I said, talked about the lab, the lab is here in this section 5.3 that says lab here. If you click on this programming lab, uh, you have all your instructions here. Here's a chart. Uh, I will just go to the code board solution itself. So here you'll see that there's an employee data.csv. This file has all the data in it. And then you can do your analysis in this file. I've given you the code to read the data, right? So please you do it and please follow what I said today earlier. Okay. Please uh, delete my tests. They are not the key thing for you. Make your own tests, make your own analysis, make sure you pass your own tests. And if you have any problem with my tests, when you hit submit or when you run my tests, just hit submit and send me an email. I will look into it and I don't want any of you to get spend too much time wrestling with my tests. Okay. They're only there to help you and eventually to put some kind of grade to validate that you've done some work, but that they are not, they're not the key idea here. The key idea for me is that you guys are actually able to do some analysis on some realistic looking data. Okay. And write the Python code to do it. So go ahead and do it. And I'm here to help in as many ways as possible. So just reach out wherever you need. Okay. Okay, so now let me just go back and then show you the next. Okay, this class is not about theory, right? It's about labs. So it is about doing a lot of analysis, right? So I don't want to spend too much time lecturing. Um, I can show you some, since I'm scrolling through this, I can show you that it is possible. Uh, for example, I have actually animated uh, a gradient descent. So I don't know if we can see this now, but... Yeah, you can see this. You can actually see that it's possible to actually visualize uh, how a, a computer might find a solution to um, to finding the best line. Okay, and you can actually visualize the approach to the solution as well. So there's lots of exploratory data science that we can do. Uh, of course, I have to be very candid here. We're declaring victory on a lot of interesting things by using one-dimensional data, one-dimensional modeling. The real world is very, very multidimensional. So we have to deal with that. Okay. But since I said that comment, that brings us to the next data set that I've given you in the lab. And I kind of felt this data set was mildly romantic. It's an old data set. You can tell me as you work through this lab and as I describe it, if you find it interesting. So this data set goes to Galton, Francis Galton. You might have heard of him in your statistics classes. I didn't really hear of him until I went to statistics. But Galton was a relative of Darwin. And uh, I want you to appreciate the mindset. We are talking about 1885, okay? And we are sitting here today in 2019, right? So a long way before. And Galton came up with this simple question that are, how do traits propagate? Because Darwin was talking about, you know, survival of the fittest and propagation of traits from parents to children and so on. So Galton was looking at the simple question, how do traits propagate from parents to children? And he really thought that, uh, okay, there's a whole discussion on eugenics here that I won't go into. But what is beautiful, which I want all of you to take away is Galton said, okay, fine, let me go get some data and check this out. And so he did what all of us should be doing today much more easily because you can easily post a survey online or whatever and get data. But he manually collected data for 933 children and their parents. Okay, that's a lot of work to go to people's houses, measure heights and so on. I don't know exactly how we did it, but he produced a data set. I have actually got that data set for you. So we can do some time travel and go back to Galton's world and say, okay, I have this data set. Now, what can I do? Okay. And let me just talk to you about the structure of this data set because it's, it reflects a little bit the tediousness of the real world. That data which comes from the real world is not ready for analysis. Right. So Galton first went and he said, okay, when I measure someone's height, so I'm just showing you what the data set contains. It has a few columns in the first column. It has whether the individual being measured is male or female. In the second column, he has a piece of data that we don't end up using heavily, but it's quite useful. It tells you whether individuals belong to one family or not. 
Okay, so all those who are in one family get a family ID in the data set. Then there's the height of the individual, the height of the father and the mother. And all of these heights are measured in inches. Okay, so it's a pretty nice set, data set. There's about 1,900, oh, sorry, 900 entries in it. So what can we say about, given the parent's height, how good a predictor is it of the children's height? And in particular, we can ask the question, are the children of tall parents tall? Okay, that's not precise yet. If the parent's height is taller than the average parent's height, is the child's height taller than the average child's height, right? And you know, by how much? By the same amount, by less amount, etc. That was Galton's question, right? Now I'm going through this. This data set is your second lab, okay? I'm going through this in detail because you can. I want to share with you how one has to be very pragmatic in dealing with this data. So first of all, it's pretty obvious to us that males and females have different average heights. So it's actually what is called a bimodal distribution. There are two kinds of populations mixed in. And Galton made an assumption, which is not necessarily the perfect one, but given the computational state of things in that time, he made an assumption that I will make it a unimodal or a single kind of distribution. And he went somewhere. I don't even know how he came up with this factor. So if any of you find out, you let me, please let me know. He figured out an adjustment factor. And he said that I will make a woman's height into, I will transmute a woman's height into an equivalent man's height by multiplying by a factor of 1.08. Okay. So if you find out where this 1.08 comes from, I've just taken Galton's analysis and just tried to reproduce it. Right. So you, you have to multiply all the females heights by 1.08. This is a fairly easy thing to do in code. Uh, sorry. This is not the fairly. So, oops, I'm sorry. Females, uh, females heights means that if the individual is a female, so in order to do this, you have to check the first column and see if, you know, look at the data here, you see it says, if you're a female, then I have to change your height. If you're a male, I don't change your height. Okay, so you have to look through this and do it. And then all the mother's heights have to be multiplied by the same adjustment factor. After you do this, you create what is called an average parent's height. You take the father's height and the adjusted mother's height and you average it. So that becomes your X value, this average adjusted height. And then you try to predict the adjusted height of the males and females. The males are unadjusted, the females are adjusted. You try to predict that, right? So that was Galton's basic idea, okay? And I just want to show you the outcome. Yeah, this is how the data looks and there's some line. And I will just tell you the million dollar question here. What Galton was interested, and this is something you should reflect and maybe ask me as well. Is the slope of this line, if it's one, if it's greater than one, and if it's less than one, that tells us something about what happens to the child's height given to the parent's height. Since we're not in a very interactive mode, if I ask the question, I don't get back. But some of you can tell me, but you should definitely spend some time and ponder, okay? The meaning of the slope in this particular context. Okay, I outlined the second part of the lab to you. So let me just ask you quickly, how, how does everyone feel about how does everyone feel about this analysis? A little bit more tricky because they adjust everything, etc. Confident? Can do it? I'm watching chat. Ready to try. Okay. Okay. Like I said, please, this is these are tricky things. Things can break. Make sure you write your own tests. Spend chunks of time. If there's problems, you know, I will try to check my mail at least once a day. So within 24 hours, you should get some response from me. Okay, I'm here to help, okay? And of course, as you can see, I've tried to give you interesting assignments. It's very complicated because I have to copy this to this data from somewhere, the code from somewhere and put it in some place. I've tried my best to make it all work nicely and give you a seamless experience. So if there's any problems, don't hesitate to reach out, okay? And uh, only one person said ready to try. Anyone else? Okay, okay, more than one, okay. Um, Okay, so let me just mention one more thing. I'm just trying to stress to you now a different point here. First, the data in the world is not necessarily clean and nice and easy. And we have to make very clever assumptions before we can manage it. Once you're clear about the assumptions, Python allows you to manage this data. When you write all this adjustment code, it will give you a flavor of how annoying it is. It's easy in our mind to manage data by saying change this or change that. But now you have to write small programs to manage the data. 
Uh, if we do a more advanced course, there are some libraries that help you to manage data, like pandas, for example. But those are an investment of time in itself. It's like learning Python. You have to learn pandas. So there's a lot of uh, overhead to picking up a library. But of course, I recommend in the long run, you can do that. But that would become an entire course to use each one of those tools. Okay. So I just want to, sh you know, while I was here, I, rem I did not include this in the labs. If any of you are interested in this data set, uh, I, I can share the data with you. But I just wanted to show you this because uh, I come from a physics background. It's an extremely beautiful data set. This is a small data set that was collected by Hubble when he was working at the Wilson Observatory. Right? And he did a very simple thing. He went and he measured the distances of star, of, of galaxies. Right? He measured the distances of galaxies. And he measured the speed at which they were moving relative away from us. And if you look at this plot, you can see that there is some kind of correlation, right? The further away things are, the faster they're moving. And so he did a simple linear regression on this data. And he came back with what is called Hubble's law, right? That the, which is basically telling us that the universe is expanding, right? And this very famous constant, which is the slope of his analysis, it's called the Hubble's constant, right? And it's true that his data was not the most accurate, but it's the first time that somebody applied a simple data analysis to, you know, something that people are speculating about, collected a small data set, did a nice minimalistic analysis. And one of the byproducts of this, which is really important apart from Hubble's law itself, was that he was able to kind of calculate a guess and an estimate for how old the universe is. His, his data was wrong, so he came back with an answer that the universe is 2 billion years old. Uh, with better data now, we know that it's more like 13 billion years. But I just put this on the screen to show you the power of this simple analysis. Right? If you deploy it into the right places with the right data and keep a very simple model building mind, there's uh, you know amazing things that we can unlock. Right? And these tools now hopefully after this discussion are in your hands and uh, all of you can do this analysis. Okay, so if any of you want this data, you can send me a note and I will send it to you. I didn't want to overwhelm you with too much of lab work, okay? But please use the lab, please write this. And now one last thing here I want to mention. I did all this using simple code to show it, well, first to give you the whole idea of this talk is to give you reasons to practice Python, right? And say, if I write Python, I can do all these cool things. The industrial strength answer to this is to use libraries like scikits or stats models. But of course, the moment you use a library, everything becomes a black box and you just work through the interface and you ask it to build a model and so on. But you don't understand what's happening as well as we can do here when we can peel back the covers. So for a first introduction to Python and data science, I thought this is a better approach than just giving you a library. For the next step, of course, we will do this in the library. And if you have massaged your data and made it clean, then the library is pretty much two lines of code to do this. So I want to stress to you again, this kind of delicate balance, right? That asking the right questions, which we started off this class on, is the most important thing. Uh, writing Python to manage all this infrastructure and data and make things interactive is probably just as important. And the easiest thing in some ways is to plug this into a pre-built library and push a button, right? But that is a progression that all of you will have to traverse. Um, so that's mostly what I, I actually made good progress through this code. Uh, I, I can take some quick questions from all of you. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna go back to the website and review a couple of things. Um, are there any questions at this moment? All of you are uh, regression and data science experts at this point. How do you feel? I think I compressed it so much that I have even few minutes to spare. Okay, rather than watching chat, maybe I can get all of you to take a quick poll and we could even finish a little early today uh, because I've been running over in previous classes and take your questions and so on. Um, so can you quickly take these two polls for me? I'll give you a minute. Uh, the polls are in the summary section at the bottom, at the bottom of session five.
Can everybody find it, I hope? Only one of you. I guess I'm quick to switch gears. Uh, are you able to get there? Do you need more instructions? Computer's loading. Okay, okay. sorry, it's slow. <laughs> I wonder why it's fast for me, but I'm surprised. Uh, take your time. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. So yeah, yeah. Maybe all of us click the button at the same time. Maybe I click before you. Yeah, yeah. Just give it a second. It'll come. <laughs> I hope we didn't crash the server, but it should come in a second. Okay. So while we wait for this web page, quick, uh, give me some comments and feedback. No, I mean uh, the the brunt of this this session was to give you some perspective on a topic, right? The Benefit of this session is when you sit and write code and you think about these ideas, which is if, if you finish a few minutes early, that's something I encourage all of you to do. Right. And then working through the labs will solidify all this. Um, but at this moment, uh, I'm curious to know what you guys think about this topic. Okay, some people have taken the poll at least. <laughs> Let me see where we are. Okay, some of you find the programming challenging. Some of you like data science, mathematics. Okay, at least one person maybe uh, finds some math. So yes, yeah, so I wanna say that one of my, uh, as a mathematician and as a physicist, one of my efforts is to try to make the mathematics accessible to everybody. Uh, but of course, you can see I've had to move it into another course. So for those who would like to learn the mathematics in an easy interactive way like this, let me know and we can figure it out. Um, for those who say it's inter interesting and I can see how Python makes it easy to work, that's, that's really what we wanted to do, right? With this course was to show you how can we use Python to get better at all this. For those who find the programming challenging, I can only give you the simple advice, right? Keep practicing and practice does not mean necessarily always writing innovative new programs just doing simple activities just doing the labs again thinking about stuff and writing code again should be enough to get you past the learning hub if you still have problems drop me a note we can spend some time one-on-one -on -one or whatever talking about what the challenges may be okay okay and uh, quizzes okay so let me see how everybody's doing there 50, okay. Okay, at least one of you is doing very well. <laughs> so that's that's great, right? So for those, who, so I will address each one of these groups, okay? For those who are absorbing the material and practicing but a bit behind on the labs, I will extend some, give you some extra time on the labs. But please don't take that as a reason to not do your regular practice, okay? Please make it into a habit. Hopefully all this work has given you plenty of reasons why you should develop this habit and get stronger in it. So please go ahead and do it. If there are challenges, reach out to me. Maybe I can suggest something or whatever, but don't let life happens, right? So we got to fight and take what we can from it. So make sure that you have a good schedule and a good structure to support you. Um, uh, somebody's asking about percentage. I'll come there. Okay. For the, the second group who says that, uh, I'm a bit behind on labs. I already said I will. Uh, I will give extensions on that. Uh, for those who are busy, may you know better time management. Time more than time management, some energy management might help. But again, it's a big topic we can discuss. What percentage uh, do we have to get to pass the course? Is there any way to make each question in the lab worth one point rather than the whole? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. So don't worry. Actually, I will. When I send out an email on the extensions, I will write this out. Right? What is the thing? Yeah, I also noticed the lab is one point, but actually it's not one point. Uh, if you remember when we started the course, I sent out a note talking about how the course would get created. I forget now where it's located. So let me pull that all up and send you uh, send it to you in an email, okay? Uh, the, it, it, it is not true that the quizzes count for 10 points and the lab is worth one point. It, it's, there's a weight factor in there and then it's worth a lot more. Um, so yes. Uh, it's worthwhile to do it. Uh, I will send you the details on the grading policy in an email. But I do want to stress this. Please make sure that 
in any way i am giving you and stressing on this i am giving you opportunities to practice writing code right and do it and if for those who are mildly advanced if this is all easy reach out to me and i can give you new data sets or more complicated pro problems or even make separate labs for you if necessary um and 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 so at the end of this course if all of you are saying i i'm great at python and i can do data analysis and i can manage data and all these things we would say mission accomplished and all of us celebrate right um uh can the labs be out of five instead of one so many yeah yeah so yes it, I, I will i will explain this how the the labs right now yeah think of one as 100% okay so by the way i want to mention this quickly um i don't want to overstress this but i i will just mention this since we are talking about labs uh, uh let me just go to the labs for this class for example if you click on the labs here if you click on the labs here like i said and i will say this one more time because i want all of you to do this make sure you don't use my tests you write your own tests and make sure you pass your own tests and then if you fail if my tests are failing just click on submit and send me send me an email okay don't spend too much time troubleshooting my tests and trying to get 100% i know all of you want 100% okay and i will help you get it as long as you have written some code that you think is reasonable and works we can easily get you the numbers okay maybe you won't get it instantly but i will work with you to make sure you get it now the important thing is this if you hit after you test your code make sure everything works you run my tests as well and you think you pass 100% of it or you don't pass 100% of it if you hit submit first of all please remember you must save your code otherwise you will lose code in part of the bugs that i've had is because he doesn't want to save and i have other tools that automatically save things for example jupyter notebooks automatically save things so i have a bad habit of not hitting save all the time my recommendation at this point is start doing your analysis in jupyter and or your favorite python environment and then just paste your answers into here but okay for those who don't have an environment just start working here but hit save for sure okay once you hit save finish your test you hit submit then you can hit reload when you hit reload you will get it says one point possible here you will get some fraction here but think of that as a one point is 100% okay think of that as so whatever fraction comes think of it as a percentage okay this percentage is then multiplied by a weight factor and added to your grade book so i i forget now exactly what the weight factor is so that's what i will check and tell you so if you get 100% on this lab you will get like 10 points i don't know i'm just saying 10 okay or 25 points i don't remember the exact number now okay so you'll get bigger points than this but think of this as a percentage score does that help i guess for most of you 100% is the only acceptable number here right but still does that help yeah so if i check yeah if i change it to 5 it doesn't change anything right that's like saying 500% so think of this as a percentage don't think of it as a point because this percentage will get multiplied by a weight factor and that multiplied quantity is what goes in a grade book and for those who are interested you can go to the web course website once you've done all your submissions and everything and you can click on this progress bar and you should see all your submissions and where you stand and blah 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 you can see all this stuff right so that's all the infrastructure there uh, it's all nice but i don't want to stress the grades and uh, numbers okay i want to stress all of you learn learn python and learn these ideas and spend time and get strong okay okay that's mostly all if there are no questions we can end early but if there are questions i'd love to take them please send ask me on chat uh, i didn't see any questions yet Okay it's kind of Valentine's Day weekend so hopefully you will spend time with uh, with your friends and uh, uh and and have a great weekend and practice some python along the way I please expect an email from me over the weekend uh you giving you extensions on the labs and giving you details about what is the weight factor on the labs etc uh keep up the good work and I'll talk to all of you uh, soon if you need any help send me emails and I will respond Thank you so much.